Well, conservation and animal protection groups are contributing to a reward for details in a series of poisonings that killed eight wolves in eastern Oregon. State troopers found the gray wolves dead in Union County earlier this year and say more than one poison was used there. A reward for information leading to a conviction is now up to nearly $43,000. Predator Defense has put up $5,000 to the reward. Executive Director Brooks Fay says this is so much worse than poaching. I find it to be, you know, domestic terrorism. When people are, go to the point where they're willing to put deadly poisons that can also kill people and dogs and, and other things too, like magpies and skunks that were also killed, I think it's uh, grave, gravely concerning and that something needs to be done about it. Poisons don't kill wolves right away, and Fahey says deaths are violent and can take several hours. Found uh, the armed person involved in that student-on-student -student robbery making their way to campus. They brought them into custody without incident, but when they noticed that student, that's when they moved the school into lockdown. That meant lights off, students and staff locked in their classrooms and hiding. Now, we did get a statement uh, from the Roosevelt principal following up on some of the safety changes they're making in response to this incident. Now, they're saying that they're going to be adding safety associates during the day, adding a safe space to the counseling center, as well as new support plans for students. And we saw the police activity at the school Tuesday afternoon. Additionally, Astor Elementary and George Middle School were, put, were placed on lockout. That means that no one was allowed into the school building at the time. Police say it was all because of the student who reportedly robbed another student with a weapon off campus. Now, the school is on a slightly different bell schedule today. They're starting at around 8.30 this morning, getting out at 12.10. Also, they're giving students the option to learn virtually if they don't feel safe coming into school today. Uh, Dan, the school is also, also asking any students with more information about what happened to come forward, right? Yeah, basically, they want to hear from students if they know anything about this particular incident. Also, just reminding students that they have the opportunity to provide information if there is a potential threat that they think is going to make their campus unsafe. You can use the Safe Oregon tip line, the number on your screen here, 844-472-3367. There's also a Safe Oregon app that students can use to connect with those who might be able to get in touch with police and make the situation a little safer. Inequity. Uh, and educational gaps between black and brown students and majority culture had, has been widening for decades. The COVID-19 pandemic is further highlighting racial injustice and inequity in many ways, including health care, economy and jobs. And tonight we're focusing on children's education. Good evening. Thanks for joining us, everybody. I'm Steve Dunn. Studies show it's a problem all across the nation with several different factors colliding. K2's Francis Lynn is live with us tonight with more on the story. What'd you learn here, Francis? Studies have shown that minority kids' education is disproportionately affected by the pandemic. And while a local charter school is tackling this issue, there is still much more to be done. According to the Society for Research and Child Development, here are some reasons why some kids get hit extra hard. Black children don't have as many resources to learn remotely. And having access to, you know, a computer. Black children also experience higher levels of anxiety, worried about the pandemic affecting families' finances. A lot of our kids are impacted by that kind of stuff. Black parents disproportionately represent essential staff, unable to work from home, so can't supervise a learning space. White. You know what I'm saying? A kid having to share a room with several siblings and being able to have, uh, you know, the right environment to study and focus and be able to concentrate. This is why Eric Knox founded the Hollow Charter School, just approved by the Reynolds School District Board. The school will center around black, brown and indigenous curriculum and teachers. Most of the schools nowadays don't teach that and they only teach it during the month of like February or, or uh, May for Cinco de Mayo and things like that and only during Thanksgiving for indigenous cultures. Black and brown and indigenous students don't often see themselves in the, the culture of the school, in the curriculum of the school. The goal is to counter some of those setbacks that have only grown during the pandemic. There's an African proverb that says, until a lion gets a historian tells of hunting, we'll always glorify the hunter. I thought it was a bunch of white folks that pretty much 
discovered America and built America and, and caused America to thrive. And so we want to make sure that our voices are heard. We want to make sure that the lion's perspective is told. The city that works needs to live up to its name and come up with solutions that really scale. New at 6 tonight, an issue K2 has been tracking for more than two years now. Homeless camps taking over beaches along the Willamette River. The problem has only worsened during the pandemic. Thanks a lot for joining us for K2 News at 6, everybody. I'm Steve Dunn. And I'm Reich Asway in for Deb Knapp. As K2's Angelica Thornton reports, there is no plan to deal with it. I would say over the last several months, the encampments have built up more and more. Like a lot of people, Nat Parker is careful about how he talks about homelessness. Um, I'd say, you know, the further south that you get along the beach, the, um, I would say, the, <laughs> the, the more concerning it has become. Specifically the camps on Swan Island's Lindbergh's Beach. But he has to tread even more lightly as the new co-chair of the Overlooked Neighborhood Association. Number one, having children seeing hypodermic needles, used needles, and paraphernalia, I think is a, it's a public health concern. Parker has a list of concerns. Um, obviously garbage along the waterfront from a pollution perspective. And he's worried about his neighbors, but he stresses that includes the ones living on the beach. Safety is my number one concern, making sure that people aren't hurt that we're not seeing overdoses, that people have access to service when they need it. Second is to not allow this to become normal. And that's one of my biggest challenges, is that we're allowing this type of thing to proliferate. This isn't a new problem, but it is a complicated one because of who owns the land. Above the ordinary high water mark, it's the Port of Portland. Below, it's Oregon's Department of State Lands, or DSL. In the summer of 2019, the Port of Portland and Daimler Trucks, one of the port's tenants, asked DSL to enact restrictions because of illegal activity. There were letters, meetings, and public hearings leading to a temporary overnight camping ban, which eventually became permanent. Here we are two and a half years later. The signs are still up and the complaints are still pouring in. Littering, dumping, burning, damage, and danger to people and the environment. It hasn't been an effective long-term solution. Um, folks still don't have shelter and folks are still looking to that space as a place to live. Allie Ryan Hansen is the communications manager for the Oregon Department of State Lands. She says sweeps just don't work. There's nowhere for people to go, so they come back. So for now, DSL is doing what it can to keep the area clean and safe while working with adjacent property owners to come up with long-term solutions. Hansen says that could take years. It's a big, complicated social issue that isn't going to be up to the, the Department of State Lands to solve. This is very much a local issue, a community issue, and one that we are going to be a part of solving, but not necessarily the only the only voice in solving. The Port of Portland told us something similar. They're working with the City of Portland and DSL on an approach that prioritizes safety and compassion for people living outside. And from the City of Portland's Homelessness and Urban Camping Impact Reduction Program, a statement saying in part, in areas with multiple owners, we work closely with partners to determine the best path forward. Add several private companies to that already crowded path and it gets even more tricky. This is what you'll see if you float upriver from Lindbergh's Beach. Tiny homes perched above the water. Some of them are built into the trees. Others are buried under logs into the hillside. This is Union Pacific Railroad property, which says it's working to address the issue. A spokeswoman told us, despite efforts to keep our tracks clear and safe, unlawful encampments are set up on our property, putting lives at risk and resulting in some people treating our property as a dump site. It is illegal, unsafe, and creates a hazard for the public as well as Union Pacific employees. We're near Christmas, it's getting colder, people need help right away. Whether it's on the river or right in front of his home, Nat Parker doesn't think the city is moving fast enough. He says Portland is letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. Imagine this were a natural disaster. 
Imagine there were flooding in the city. What would we do to actually get people housed quickly, get them services, get them sanitation, get them certainty, counseling, and help? Um, it's that urgency and that sort of desensitized nature to this problem that really bothers me. And we want to be part of the solution. It's, it's incumbent upon residents to also help, but we want to see something happen. It